uh, to uh, Aaron Ellis right over here, who's a very active member of Students for Justice in Palestine. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it. Um, as I was thinking about how to introduce uh, the speaker, who is actually my father, I was going to like write something down and okay. really working on it, and then I thought, what the hell, he it's is my father. I've known him, I guess, my whole life. And maybe for more than my actual life. I'm not a biologist. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is the... the thought that counts. As, as the thought that counts. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is the guy who, uh, I mean, I've known him as an academic, but this is also the guy who uh, pulled me out of school uh, early, signing me out for doctor's appointments so that we could go play baseball. Okay, so I want to tell you that the guy that you're going to hear from is, uh, is a warm man, and a generous man, and a kind man, and at the same time, he is one who uh, does not hesitate to speak for those on the margins, uh, for those who are oppressed, and he also does not hesitate to point a critical finger at himself and at his own community, uh, which is a quality that uh, so many lack, but that is so needed in our times and for all times. So thank you very much for being here, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Ellis. <laughs> thank you for that introduction. Uh, I count it one of my greatest feats, getting signing Aaron out for, uh, yeah. Well, the baseball field was done by four. You couldn't practice on it after it was done, the evening game. I had to get him out because we had to practice. So I'd go up, I'd sign him out for a doctor's appointment, and we'd go out for an hour and practice baseball. Uh, one of my great feats from my perspective. But uh, it's also really great to be back at Florida State Florida State University formed me, especially the Religious Studies Department. Um, I owe a great uh, debt of gratitude to Florida State. And I'm going to be speaking a little bit more about that through my teacher, Richard Rubenstein. Uh, but uh, tonight we gather uh, in an unfortunate uh, situation. Uh, we call it the Israel-Palestine crisis, peace process, whatever. It's been going on forever and it is going to go on for a lot longer. Uh, and I want to share with you some thoughts that I have, and then we could open it up for civil discussion uh, and uh, continue on. So thank you for coming, and thank you for the organizations that have put in so much work to sponsor this uh, so we can have a discussion here tonight. I want to share with you a PowerPoint. Let's see if we've got this. Uh, we've just gone through Passover. This is our Passover home uh, table at home. The question I have of Passover is the question that every Jew has. What is liberation? And in every generation, we are called upon to ask that question. So we are called upon to put us ourselves there. We were there in Egypt, but also now. Uh, and what does it mean for liberation? Has our empowerment liberated us as Jews? And if it hasn't, what would it take? Central question. I've been asking it forever. Uh, we asked it again uh, during this time. More and more Jews are asking it. Has our empowerment liberated us? What would it take for Jews to be truly liberated? Well, uh, President Obama, I was just on a speaking tour uh, through New England. Uh, President Obama, this is some pictures of him uh, be, uh, in his first visit to Israel before he became president uh, at Yad Vashem, at the Western Wall, at APAC, and of course, President Obama is known as being cool, but uh, the only time I've ever seen a picture of him like this, either he had incredible jet lag, which I understand you don't get on his presidential jet, Air Force One, or he was so angry, he showed it with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, I think it was uh, anger. And his visit uh, just a few days ago at Yad Vashem, at Theodore Herzl's grave site, the Dead Sea Scrolls, speaking uh, to the youth of Israel. And I put this picture very small with the Palestinian Authority. 
it's very interesting because he went to Israel, but in no communique was it saying that he went to Israel and Palestine. He spent most of his time in Israel. Uh, and if you notice from President Obama, whom I'm a supporter of, and I've had these discussions with Aaron, I understand, I'm of a certain generation, very important that we had an African-American president. Then the question is, what has he done? And on this trip, I have to say, he was pathetic. And I'm losing whatever hope I had in President Obama. Not because I, he identifies with Jews. No. But because he does not identify in the same way with Palestinians. I just wanted to give you an example. We'll go on. Whenever President Obama talks about Jews at the United Nations and the Cairo address before that, in his visit to Israel and Palestine, Jews are an exceptional people. Jews have a history. Jews have a destiny. By the way, I'm a little old-fashioned. I agree with that. Palestinians have a need. They have a need for freedom and a state. But he never talks about their history, their exceptional qualities, their destiny. When you have a need, as opposed to a history and a destiny, watch out. President Obama declared himself a lame duck on the Middle East in his first year of his second term. Now why? I have a theory. Nobody has thought about it or agrees with me, or both. President Obama was mentored by Jews in Chicago. It's a very interesting story. Many of those Jews were chewed up by the Jewish establishment. They were progressive Jews. So he owes a great debt, and as he said in his speech, to Jewish history, to the Jewish people, even the Passover gave him a sense of hope for himself. But the question, too, politically, is where does he go for support to Jews? And in his post-presidential life, who is going to support an African-American ex-president? My own sense is he's very anxious about the time after he leaves office. And politically, why would he stand up for Palestinians as true equals in the American political system? He doesn't mean that way. Does that mean he doesn't empathize with Palestinians? No, he does. But it's not equal. This is a Jewish poet, Adrian Rich, recently died. One of her poetic renderings, whatever is unnamed, undepicted in images, whatever is omitted from biography, censored in collections of letters, whatever is misnamed as something else, made difficult to come by, whatever is buried in memory by the collapse of meaning under an inadequate lying language, this will become not merely unspoken, but unspeakable. Now this applies across the board. But I'm asking us to think today about what is unnamed, what is censored, what is unspoken about Israel-Palestine, and what becomes unspeakable, unless we speak it, unless we surface it, unless we name it. tells the truth, she is creating the possibility for more truth around her, from Adrian Rich again. When we speak the truth, together, we create more truth around us. This is what this week is about, and other weeks, right? The university is supposed to be about creating more truth by sharing truths. Until we know the assumptions in which we are drenched, we cannot know ourselves. What assumptions are we as Jews? talk about other communities too, okay. But what assumptions do we have as Jews, or Barack Obama has, 
that are so deep within us, we don't even know what they are anymore. We don't speak about them. We can't see them. Finding our own voice, naming the unnameable, speaking the truth, we discover the voice of conscience. For every Jew, it has been very difficult to find this voice because of our history. Finding this voice and then speaking it, you think, well, it's obvious, you see it, you speak it. No. And then the pressures against speaking it. We had a comedic sense of why I'm important. It hasn't been that funny all the time, but anyway, I appreciate it. How many Jewish voices have been lost? And how many Jewish voices have never been found because teachers in the academy weren't allowed to speak this? So Jews didn't hear it over the last 30 or 40 years, but also others, non-Jews, didn't hear these messages either. What is the cost of that? And how would it have been different if it had been named earlier and spoken and accepted even as part of the truth? Because every voice should be heard. Every part of it should be heard, and it's complex. But in the end, we as Jews have to stand for those on the outside. That's my bias. For those on the margins, for us today as Jews, those are the Palestinian people. Well, a trip down memory lane, but with intent. It's my teacher, Richard Rubenstein. This was at my center in 2000, so I have not been able to find a picture on the internet of him when I had him as a student. If anyone has one, please send it. Formidable man, and not, as I say to my students, a huggy. He just told you the truth, and you had to bear with it. He wasn't concerned about your feelings or how you would rate him or evaluate him. Believe me, he told you the truth as he saw it, and then you had to listen to it and do with it what you want. I'm so grateful for those teachers. I hope you still have them at Florida State University. After Auschwitz, my original copy noticed $2.45. Raised deep questions about God. Where was God in Auschwitz and the covenant? Could we as Jews accept the covenant again after Auschwitz? And where was humanity? Rubenstein was a troubled, troubling thinker, maybe a troubled man, he would say, at different times. But it was an interesting, broad thinker. My brother Paul, this is an aside, I had a student once say, why didn't he write about his sister? That's not his actual brother, that's Paul the saint. Rubenstein is only going to place himself in that kind of company. I once said to an expert on Paul, what did you think of Rubenstein's my brother Paul? He said to me, well, it was more about Rubenstein than Paul, and I said, absolutely. I had an uh, advisor after I took my first course with him, I said, I'd like to sign up for another course with Dr. Rubenstein. What is he teaching? He said, well, it's always the same thing. It's about him. And I said, I hope so. <laughs> this was in the 1970s. Power struggle. Rubenstein also had a power struggle with the Jewish establishment. Why would he be in Tallahassee in 1970? At that point, there weren't 100 Jews as students in, at Florida State University. He was sent into exile. Tallahassee was his exile. Why? Because he raised difficult questions about the Holocaust. The Jewish establishment at that time did not want the Holocaust discussed. Now it's discussed endlessly. And Rubenstein's understandings of God, no. Now they're respected. So Rubenstein was an outlier. He said no, he was exiled. That's where I met him. I had no idea that I would be in exile too. 
later. And this is the reason. 1975, Rubenstein published The Cunning of History. It's a 98-page book, extremely powerful book, where he talked about the 20th century as a century of mass death, not just the Holocaust, the whole century. History is a cycle of violence and atrocity. You know, you're either up or you're down. Well, the United States government operates that way too, right? So does Israel. Other countries do. You're either up or you're down. If you can have power, use it. Anyone challenges you, keep them down. Because if they have power, they'll put you down. No end to it in history. Of course, this is scaring me to death. But hey, no huggies from rooms here. The night side of the Judeo-Christian tradition, don't expect Judaism or Christianity to rescue you. It's part of the reason there's a cycle of violence and atrocity. That's another issue. <coughs> but here, the necessity of Jewish power after the Holocaust. And all the Holocaust theologians who disagree with Rubenstein on other issues agree here that Israel is the response to the Holocaust for Jews. Never again will Jews be without power. Whoever comes after us, including Palestinians, but not only, they are going to meet our power. Because from their perspective, from Holocaust theologians' perspective, the reason that Jews were put through the Holocaust is we didn't know how to organize modern power. Violence. In Israel, we learned, and Rubenstein would say, we had to learn that. Just a few days ago, this was sent to me, Stand With Us, which is a conservative or uh, pro-Israel group shows the Holocaust victims and the Israeli soldiers. This is very common in Jewish discourse, but also in the Jewish psyche. You have the Holocaust, Jewish powerlessness. Israel, Jewish power. Anything that undermines Israel, undermines Jewish power, brings us back to a possible second Holocaust. I'm celebrating the 25th anniversary of a book I wrote toward a Jewish theology of liberation. And if you notice, I'll, there are three editions. I'm going to show you the covers also to show you where it's moved. There is a Star of David. Well, this is uh, me at a younger time. 1987, the book was published before the first uprising, which started in December of 87. I was in Jerusalem in 1987 in the spring and gave a talk uh, at the Sholem Hartman Institute. I was a complete unknown, but the place was packed out. I couldn't figure out why. And it went on for four hours, and I couldn't figure out why. Until I realized later, when somebody told me, I had asked that Jews in Israel confess to the Palestinian people that what we had done as Jews and what we were doing as Jews to the Palestinian people was wrong. I have made that confession in every talk, no matter what subject they've asked me to speak on since 1987. So I just did it tonight, too. Simple. It's endlessly complex, but simple, the confession. What we have done to you, I didn't say what we have done all together, everywhere, all the time. The Palestinian people is wrong. What we are doing to you, the Palestinian people, is wrong. And I called for reparations to the Palestinian people. This is Elias Shakur, Greek Orthodox priest, who was one of my respondents. This is a rabbi who had been in Poughkeepsie, New York before. He lectured me that the Jewish tradition was now rabbinic rather than the prophetic. He now lives in Switzerland, by the way. <laughs> and Michael Walzer, who was very well known, responded to me. He was so angry at my call for reparations and confession that he was shaking as he responded to me. I thought he had Parkinson's.
The second edition, I conceptualized these covers as a Star of David and a Kafia. And the second edition came out in 1989 with a new epilogue titled The Palestinian Uprising and the Future of the Jewish People. They were linked. And here, I brought back from Jerusalem to have Orbis published, Naim Atik, a Palestinian Christian, wrote a Palestinian theology of liberation, justice and only justice. And we've worked together ever since. Now that was a learning experience for me, meeting Naim and working on his book, and a learning experience for him. <coughs> because he said things about Jews which scared me to death. But that was his experience of being uprooted and expelled from his village. And he listened to me about Jewish history and about Jews, things he didn't want to hear. Because the Jews he had interacted had been occupiers. He had never met a Jew who didn't want an occupation. And here's the third edition, published in 2004, and it has an olive tree, symbol of Palestinian steadfastness, in the middle of the Star of David. And yes, I was criticized. I thought it was very avant-garde. And the first night I previewed it, a Palestinian said, why isn't the olive tree bigger? OK, I got it. But here I'm saying again, we're linked together, for better and for worse. My new golden rule for Christians, I know this isn't a Christian university, but some of you have a Christian background. If our salvation is dependent on the oppression of the other, it cannot be our salvation. I say this about European-dominated Christianity that went around the world, dominating peoples who eventually became Christian. But can you be saved when your salvation is dependent on the oppression of the other? For Jews, if our liberation is dependent on the oppression of the other, it cannot be our liberation. Now, does Israel have to depend on the oppression of Palestinians? I would say no. Has it been? Yes. What are we going to do to undo the oppression if we're going to move toward liberation? Jewish theology of liberation had some of these themes. Holocaust theology, all of you know of Eli Wiesel, I assume, Knight. He was one of the, he's the best known Holocaust theologian, but there were others. I talk about the cost of our empowerment. Yes, Jews need to be empowered, I believe that. But we also have to ask, what is the cost of our empowerment? The interfaith dialogue and political deal after the Holocaust, Jews and Christians came together. Christians were tired of their theology causing the oppression of Jews. So they said, many, clean it up. And we said as Jews, get off our backs. Right. The vehicle for Christian repentance in this interfaith ecumenical dialogue was support of Israel. Jews said, Israel is our center. You must support it. When Christians began to criticize policies of the state of Israel, the Jewish establishment said, you're returning to anti-Semitism. That's when it became a deal. Christians had to be silent. Today, that's broken. That deal, right? But if you're not interested in interfaith ecumenical the dialogue deals, OK. But it's also a political deal in the United States. If you speak for Palestinians as a political figure, you're dead politically. <coughs> Finish. It's over. We have a whole history of those who spoke for Palestinians whose political careers were over. Does this help Jews in Israel? In my opinion, no, it does not. 
If you remember the Republicans, I know. I mean, each candidate was more pro-Israel than almost any Jew I've ever met. <laughs> But look at Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's commentary in front of APAC. They're also tripping over each other to be more pro-Israel than the other. Does this help Israel? I don't think so. I surface the idea that liberation theology is emanating from Latin America. That is, those who are conquered by the Gospels. This is what I use, uh, right? They're conquered by Christianity. Now they're Christian, turning Christianity upside down. But we were hit and dominated by European Christianity within Europe. It was the same thing within and outside. Don't we have bonds together? I discovered, because I didn't know, as most Jews didn't know, this is 1987, I know Ice Age, but I wasn't taught about this in Hebrew school. I had to learn and find my own voice. So I discovered there were Jews before me, and now after, who have dissented on Israel. Some didn't support the state at all. Some were against the Jewish state. Some supported the state in a certain way. <coughs> We'll talk about this more. But there's a whole history of Jewish dissent on the question of Israel, which most Jews don't know about. And even today, they're not taught about it. And that's one of the reasons why this is such an angry discussion or debate. Because most Jews, and we might have differing opinions anyway, fair enough, but most Jews don't even know that Martin Buber, probably the most famous Jew, especially philosophy, theology, what all, was against the state of Israel. He was a Zionist, by the way. We'll go into this a little bit more. And Hannah Arendt, another well-known Jewish philosopher, was against the Jewish state. And if you were to ask most Jewish students at Florida State, and I didn't know, so I'm not, you know, ignorance is you know, no problem as long as we address it. They say, what? My favorite is the Magnus Museum. I've just written a new book. I know, it's endless. The Magnus Museum in San Francisco doesn't mention anything about his stance on Israel. We're going to come to that in a second. Can you have a museum named in your name without you being present? Yes, <laughs> you can. <laughs> Trouble. An Israeli historian, but he's not the only one, Ilan Pepe, just met his teacher at Harvard, who had been at Oxford, wrote The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. That is, in the formation of the State of Israel, 700,000 or more Palestinians were driven out of what became Israel. In our parlance today, they were ethnically cleansed. Theoretical question, can Jews be ethnic cleansers? I don't want to get into theory. We were, we are. We've joined the nations in ethnic cleansing. Well, here are Martin Buber on the left. Judah Magnus was the first chancellor of Hebrew University. These are not marginal figures. Once I gave a talk, mentioned Hannah Arendt, and somebody in the audience from the Jewish establishment accused me of being a name dropper. As if I knew her personally, I'd love to have known her. Judah Magnus, I want to focus on him for a second was in New York, uh, was in Washington, D.C., right before he died, 1948, as Israel was being declared a state. And he personally lobbied, I mean, he met with the Secretary of State Marshall and President Harry Truman, personally met with them. The first chancellor of Hebrew University, a Zionist, but a homeland Zionist, 
and begged the president not to recognize the declaration of the state of Israel. In fact, he asked the president to make Palestine a trusteeship, which would have meant, although Magnus was a pacifist, the stationing of American troops in Jerusalem to keep Palestine together. He was a homeland Zionist. I want to spend a minute on this because this is not known to most Jews, including people who teach Judaism often. They believe, Buber, Hannah Arendt, and Magnus, in somewhat different ways, but in general, that Jews needed a center, that the diaspora was crumbling, especially after the Holocaust, but even before, and Jews needed a center in the land, but that center wouldn't be a state, it would be a homeland, living with the Arabs of Palestine in different ways, to emphasize Jewish values, Hebrew, education, kibbutz, socialism. They were afraid that to create a state, you would have to cleanse the Arabs of Palestine, that it would be a perpetual war, and that the state of Israel would take all the resources that should be devoted where they wanted them to a military state. And if you read Hannah Arendt in 1948, an essay, to save the Jewish homeland, there is still time. She predicted that Israel would become, if it became a state, a modern Sparta. And that all the energies of Jews worldwide would go to support that state and no dissent would be allowed. You want to read a prophetic commentary about contemporary Jewish life? Read that essay. Two recent books. Peter Beinhardt, The Crisis of Zionism. Very interesting, a progressive Jew who was very worried about the direction of Israel becoming an apartheid state. He, he talks about it becoming an apartheid state. He doesn't want that. He's a Zionist. He's a state Zionist. He wants a Jewish state. He's also very concerned that young Jews are not going to sign on to an apartheid Israel. And therefore, they're going to drift from the Jewish community. He's in between. He, he sees it coming. He wants to foreclose it. The most interesting chapter in his book is the Jewish president, Barack Obama, where he talks about how Jews were met, mentored Obama, but how most of the Jews who mentored Obama, progressive Jews, were chewed up by the Jewish establishment because they had gone too far in Israel. So the interesting thing is, Obama knows the Israel score from way back on Jewish descent. Beinhardt has already lost my view. What he wants isn't going to happen. And I'm going to tell you why by showing you some maps. Israel is not going to change. I know it's a challenge. By the way, I always have a money back guarantee when I'm being paid. Uh, if I'm wrong, if there's two real states, I come back, my own dime, and I apologize. And I'd love to. I love coming back to Florida State. Wow. Judith Butler. OK, 25 years too late. By the way, feminists have been awful on this subject. And it's a comment that's, I think, very important. And the idea that women would change the rabbinate on this issue, forget it. Sometimes they're worse. This book, Parting Ways, and I have criticisms. I have some, you know, not criticisms. I have uh, some thoughts about it. Her language, if you think I'm being too strong, believe me, you're very glad I'm here instead of her. Her language about the state of Israel, forget it. She's a one-stater. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But her language about what Israel has done is doing is much stronger than mine. She's the wave of the future. Evolving discussion within the Jewish community, I call it a civil war. Now the discussion 
is about one state. That's the evolving international discussion. One state meaning the end of the Jewish state. There would be one state for Jews and Palestinians in whatever you want to call it, Palestine, Israel, Israel, Palestine, going from Tel Aviv to the Jordan River, one state. I'm not for it or against it, I'm just talking about this. The original discussion, or the discussion over the last decades, has been two states, Israel withdrawing to the 67 borders, there being a Palestinian state, in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. But most analysts believe, and even Obama mentioned it, and other mainstream politicians have mentioned it over the last years, we're coming to the end of two states. My own view is two states ended probably in the 1970s. Really, if we look at it. But the discussion now, and there are one state conferences, all over, including in the United States, I've been asked to speak at several of them, although I say, in general, I'm a two-stater, because I'm a moderate. I'll tell you why later. But that's a loser. The intellectual discussion is one state, the end of a Jewish state. The discussion is about the violence of Zionism and emerging anti-Zionism among Jews and, of course, others. The end of progressive Jewishness. I don't think we've thought about this. I divide the Jewish community into three parts. The Jewish establishment, what I call Constantinian Judaism. I'm not going to go there tonight because that's a, an interesting discussion. All of you know about Constantinian Christianity, where Christianity in the fourth century from, went from being a marginal, mostly Jewish sect to a state religion, empire religion, where then it had a monopoly on religion, it also blessed empire. So religion and the state being in bed with one another. We have now a Constantinian Judaism. Don't worry, there's a Constantinian Islam and a Constantinian modernity too. But let's just call it the Jewish establishment for now. Then we have progressive Jews. You know Tikkun, Michael Lerner? How many of you know of? Progressive Jews have been at war with the Jewish establishment because they think the Holocaust in Israel should move in a new direction, not over against, but Palestinians, but also very paternalistic for Palestinians. So, for example, I love this one. Progressive Jews believe that Palestinians should be free, but they shouldn't have an army. Now, I'd like everyone not to have an army. You know, we could have, like, Costa Rica. Although they have a very extensive police force, which is really an army. But let's leave that. So, since all the nations of the Middle East have armies, it's a little unusual to think of Palestine without an army. They need protection. Who will protect them from progressive Jewish understandings? Israel. The people that dispossessed them, made them refugees, invaded them, demeaned them, abused them, is now going to be their protection. It's like after World War II asking Christians to protect us. And my answer is no, thank you. Over the years, there's been a new group that's evolved which says that the civil war between the Jewish establishment and the progressive Jews is false. In fact, progressive Jews are the left wing of the Jewish establishment. These are Jews of conscience who are saying, we have to go much further. We have to recognize that the situation that Jews are in is much more severe than progressive Jews. And that Palestinians have a right to be free in their own homeland and to protect themselves. That they're not our wards. They're not our dependents. But this means the end of progressive Jewishness. This is what Beinhardt's talking about. Because the center of progressive Jewishness cannot hold. That's what we're seeing now, which means for political ramifications throughout American society, too. It's not just on the Palestinian issue. OK, so maps. 
This is a postcard. There are more, and I need to get more pictures of the disappearing Palestine <laughs> over the years, Palestine in green, and the expanding Israel. These are settlements built on hills in the West Bank, and we're going to see some maps in a moment. And if you're going to have these settlements in the West Bank, Jews among millions of Palestinians, you need what I call Star of David helicopter gunships to protect them. Any, anywhere you have occupation settlement, you need a military. And of course, the Holocaust, not as it was, functions within this. We need settlements, we need helicopter gunships because of the Holocaust. Israel is different. Remember I talked about the interfaith ecumenical deal and the political deal. Among Jewish Holocaust theology, progressive Jewish thought, there's a Christian Holocaust theology. Remember, repentance, for what Christianity had done to Jews, the vehicle is Israel. It's interesting, both the Jewish narrative in the United States that supports Israel and the Christian narrative has been liberal, not conservative. It's more conservative now. But the original was liberal, not conservative. And of course, Christian Zionism, you know, when Jews return to the land, Jesus comes back again. Oh, Jews die too, but hey. In all of this, Palestinians are absent or they're seen as a threat. They don't have their own voice in Christian Zionism, in Christian Holocaust theology, in progressive Jewish thought, or Jewish Holocaust theology. Now some of you have seen this, but I want to just go through these quickly and then we'll look at some other maps. The fence, the barrier, the wall. <coughs> this is the fence. This is in the West Bank, and you can see the fence here, and then the trenches, and then there are electrical sensors, so Israeli forces can know when anyone is crossing over. And you see the separation of the land. This is Palestinian land. Makes it impossible for them to farm the land and to move about. There's the wall. Most of these pictures are done by Israeli Jews of conscience. These are the uprooting of olive trees in the West Bank. Thousands of them uprooted. These are the towers that are along the wall, which allows Israel to look inside the wall and to monitor Palestinian life. Fences to keep Jewish-only roads in the West Bank free of debris or rocks from Palestinians. Kekilia is a city that is completely walled in. You can see the tower observing what's going on inside. So we have to ask this question. Remember, it's in the West Bank. We're going to come to some maps in just a moment. Is it a security wall for Israel? If Israel in the 67 borders wants to build a wall, up to them. I'm not in favor of it, but go ahead. It's not in the 67 borders, it's in the West Bank. Is it an apartheid wall or a ghetto wall? Call it what you want. Now, here are the maps. This is the agreed upon two state solution international. Here you have Israel, here you have Palestine with East Jerusalem, Gaza, and a connector to the West Bank. That's the internationally agreed upon two-state solution. 
We can argue whether it's fair for Palestine. Anyway, that's the agreed upon international solution. All of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, with a connector, that's Palestine. Here's some maps of Israel in the West Bank. This is going to be repetitive. We'll go through them quickly. But the repetitive nature is what's significant. This is area A, the dark brown, which after Oslo, this is 1995, would go directly to Palestinian control. And here's area B, the gray, that would be under Israeli and Palestinian control, but would go back to Palestinians. So that Palestine would be dark and light. And this is Israel in the West Bank, which would remain with Israel. Now here's Israel over here, the 67 borders, right? And here's Israel. These purple <coughs> triangles are settlements, Jewish settlements, which would ultimately expand, so you basically have a purple and brown map in the West Bank. So this 1995 map, Israel's not leaving the West Bank. Here's a 1997 map. <laughs> Palestine, Israel. These are Jewish settlements which will grow. 2000, here's Palestine, here's Israel. Notice that Israel is within and in between Palestine in the West Bank on all sides. This is Barak's generous offer. Here's the 80% Palestinian control, but look where Israel is in the West Bank. Here's Taba, which is supposedly the most generous offer ever to Palestinians. Here's Palestine. Here's Israel. Again, the triangles are Israeli settlements. Notice that Israel is always on this side as well. Sharon, when he was feeling generous toward Palestinians. It's the same map. This is what Barack Obama visited. This is where he visited. This is interesting. This was in the Wall Street Journal last year. You know, Palestinians have complained correctly, rightly, Jewish dis dissenters have complained correctly, that the mainstream press has complained this. <coughs> yeah, for two decades they have. Yes, they hadn't. That's true. These maps have been in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. These are, uh, these are settlements in the West Bank, Israeli settlements. Again, if we saw this map, we take out Jews or Palestinians and just use X's and O's. Everyone would agree on what these maps mean. Everybody in this room. But when we put Jews and Palestinians, it changes to something. These maps are obvious. Israel is never leaving the West Bank. I'm not even talking about Gaza. I'm not even talking about East Jerusalem. We're never leaving that either. Not leaving. That's why the discussion has moved toward the one state. Because nobody, including Palestinian analysts, believes that we're leaving. Now, history is open. Okay. History is open. It's time. My view is that you are never leaving the last time. So, Barack Obama said when he was there, was you can have a time with his Israel and Islam, after he said Palestinian Israel.
maps of Jewish identity and truth telling. Yes, we as Jews come after the Holocaust, yes. But we come after Israel as well. What do I mean by that? After what Israel has done and is doing to the Palestinian people. Our identity as Jews is after the Holocaust and after Israel, we are no longer innocent. We are culpable in the use of our power against another people. So, we have the Holocaust, but here, these are our towns and villages in Palestine that were destroyed when Palestinians were forced out. So, what is Israel today within the 67 borders is also part of Palestine. <coughs> that is part of our identity, which we don't talk about. That those hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and that life there was expelled. Now, there were 150,000 Palestinians left in what became Israel. They're now over a million. They're citizens, but they're second or third class citizens. <clears throat> That's part of our map. And then the West Bank. This is a, a rendering of what the wall will look like when it's completed and what Palestinians will be within in the West Bank. And of course, the United States. You know, I asked this uh, as I was celebrating or commemorating the 25th anniversary of Torah Jewish Theology of Liberation, which unfortunately, you know, any author in the internet age wants his or her words to be relevant two days after they're written. But 25 years later, I'm not so glad. Because actually the message, I think, is even more important today. That's not a good sign from my perspective. And I'm not rewarded for it either, so both. We have become completely encased in the United States as Jews. Not only Israel. I mean, when you have votes in the United Nations, you have the United States, Micronesia, El Salvador, and you can name a few others that vote with us. 